It's a plus, so you should play the old plus eight gigabyte. Like, it's not, but it, it, it's eight gigabyte storage. Well, I mean, it's not eight gigabyte. Well, now it's two to the three. Add together eight. Even if you want to like, 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 how many days are past eight hours? You have to go over by two. It should go over by two, which is just dividing by there. Plus, I know. You have to have binary number. Okay. So it is 9.31. It's the end of the world. <laughs> All right. The screen is on. So I'm going to cover a little bit more about high-level state machines today. And specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about how to convert high-level C code into a high-level state machine. So like if we have an if statement in C code, what is the like state and transition like template that you can use to implement if in a high level state machine? Same thing with for loops, things like that. So here was our high level state machine for summing the absolute differences between two frames of uh, video data, right? And we started with the kind of description of the problem, right? But descriptions can be kind of ambiguous, maybe a little bit misleading. They're not very detailed all the time, right? Like if you just describe something to someone and you ask them to tell you what was the requirements back, they might tell you something different, right? So rather than starting with a description, like with multiple sentences, we can just instead provide C code. And C code is going to be hopefully deterministic. It's more compact, right? Than writing like a paragraph description, and it's much more exact, right? There's no misinterpreting an if statement or a for loop, right? And with the C code, we can also, like we talked about for like the final project or any project in general, you can print out some intermediate values and make sure that everything is exactly the same. So then if we have C code to start with, instead, how can we create these high level state machines? This is the question, right? So this is our C code, right? We have sum of absolute differences. We have two arrays of, with 256 data points in each array. This is one frame, this is another frame. I have some declared variables, sum, and uh, this is supposed to just be i, but it auto capitalized, I guess. It's capital I, but it's just supposed to be lowercase. I reset sum to zero, reset i to zero, right? And then I loop through my arrays, get the difference, absolute value, add it to sum, increment i. And then I return sum. So this is deterministic, right? I get one input, I'm always going to get the same output. And from this C code, I understand what this problem is asking me to do in hardware. Right. And it's a lot more compact than talking through like I want the sum of absolute differences. And it's more exact. So we get the benefits. All right. So if we want to convert from the C code to high level state machines, then we should convert each C construct to equivalent states and transitions. 
So if we have an assigned statement, then it can just be one state with an assignment. If we have an if and then, then we have the state with condition check. And here's our state with an assignment. This is if and then. We have our state and we have this condition check. And if we have then, and we have if we are skipping, right? So if the condition is not true, I don't do anything, right? So then statements. If the condition is true, then I have these states that implement the then statements. So you can use this construct to convert into high level state machines. What about if then else? Right? So it's going to look very similar to the if statement. I have if else. Right? You see? So if the conditions are true, I do this. If they're false, I do these ones. But in the end, afterwards, I end up in the same place. Because that's the next bit of code to do. And then we also have while loop. So what do we think the while loop is going to look like? Like you need a transition back up, right? Yes. What else? So I do the while statements if the condition is true, right? And then when I'm done with that, those statements, I check if I go back. But what about now when the condition is false? They go to state. Yeah. Okay. State. Right. So here's the beginning part, right? Here's my condition. If it's true, I do the statements. And then when I'm done with the statements, I come back here and I go back to check if it's true. Again, still. But when it's false, I go to the next state. All right, so then if we have this simple example, we want to compute the maximum of two numbers. So here's our C code, right? We have these unsigned integers x and y, and our output is an unsigned integer max. If x is greater than y, max is x, else max is y. Right? Here's my if and else. So we use that construct. Right? If else. It's this template. And these are my conditions. If x is greater than y, that's my then statements, and that's where max should be x. If x is not greater than y, it goes to else. And then they both end up in this end state. So what needs to go here now? Max equals x. Mm -hmm. A state where I'm doing an assignment. Max is x. And then max is y for the other state. And now I have the high level state machine implementing this C code. So if I have this C code, I can just follow these templates and create a maybe not optimal high level state machine, but a functional high level state machine that will give me the correct result. Right. So here is our previous example. And we're going to convert each construct into our high level state machine. 
And then afterwards, maybe we can simplify some states. Okay, so we have a while here. So we're, this is our while statement. So while not go, this is our uh, statement. Then if go is true, then I get out of that while loop. And then I can see that I can actually simplify this, right? I don't need multiple uh, states here. It's just if go is zero, stay in this state. Once go is one, start the assignments. So we don't need to keep all of these states. We simplified this while loop because there's actually nothing to do inside the while loop. Right? It's doing nothing. Do you see this? Okay. And then here, I have one state for each of these assignments because that's what the template says to do. But really, I can just combine them into one single state. Right? I can assign sum to 0 and i to 0 at the same time. So. We converted it directly, but then we simplified it to make it more compact. And then next, we have another while loop, right? So we give our template. So it's the same template, right? And now, if i is less than 256, we need to fill out these states. But if it's uh, not less than 256, I skip to the end. So now we need to implement these in between states for the while, which are the sum is sum plus the absolute value of a at i minus b at i, and then i is i plus one. So here's adding them here. So Normally, if I was just doing this, like we did the initial i statements here, I would have one state that is sum is sum plus absolute value, and another state i is i plus one. But we just skip that step and we combine them in one step, right? Because there is no dependence between these two. So we just combine them into this one state. And then for the end, sad is assigned to sum as the last bit. But again, we can simplify. We don't need this empty state here. We can just, after we do the sum and the increments, go back to the, our condition check. And then we don't need this empty state here. When we're done and our condition is no longer true, we can just go directly to assign our output to what sum is. And then we have this while one, so that's why we go back up here and wait for go again. That's where this last transition comes from. So this is our high level state machine for this cup. Maybe this would have been. Okay. All right. So we follow how to do this. I give you C code, you can give me a functional high level state machine. And then once we have this high level state machine, we can use our design process that we've gone over to convert it into a circuit, right? First step is, what's my first step?
That's not my first step. Copy paste. What's my first step? What do I do with the high level state machine? What do I need to create? So that's one thing I need to create. What's the other thing I need to create? Yes. And the data path comes before the finite state machine because oftentimes the data path needs to calculate some things. And also, you'll know what are the other control signals that you need for the data path, right? Is there a register that needs a load or a reset, things like that? And then the data path is what's calculating these conditions, right, with comparators. So the first step is draw the data path. Second step is once I have the data path, once I have all of those new signals, loads, clears, is I less than 256? Next step is Yeah, so you copy paste the high level state machine states and transitions. And then, like you said, you change these statements into the signal names that you created in the data path. And then, next step. Mm -hmm. Connect control to the data path. But also, you need to then define. What are the different outputs for each state of the finite state machine? Okay. So in order to make some zero I1 here, really what we're doing is setting some reset to one, I reset to one, right? So we have to do those conversions. And then we can connect the data path and controller together. So one thing to keep in mind is only a subset of C can be easily converted. We need structural code to convert C code into uh, high level state machines directly. So if you're trying to communicate to different uh, requirements for an application with someone, you just need to make sure that you write your C code in a structural way, right? And you don't have to use C code, right? You can use whatever programming language is common between you and whoever you're trying to share the requirements with. Right? And this is also something that I show you because oftentimes, why are you creating hardware for an application, like specific hardware? Why would we create hardware to do something? But why not just write C code, call it a day? Why create these high level state machines? Yeah. So the processor has a lot of overhead, right? Every single instruction, we're barely doing any work. Like maybe we add two different variables together. But with a ASIC design or applica application specific integrated circuits, we can have a lot better efficiency, a lot better execution time, and it depends on your application if that's important or not. If it's not important for your application, you just write C code and you're done, right? But if performance or energy efficiency or anything like that, or that maybe cost could be another thing. Like if you are only going to do this one function for your small embedded device, 
maybe it's not very cost effective to buy a million CPUs. Right? Maybe it's more cost effective to make this one simple design, manufacture a million of these very, very tiny chips. Right? So here is an example of how much faster these high level state machines and the digital logic implementation can be a lot faster. So if you have a circuit for this, and we just use our high level state machine that we designed here, we're mainly going between state S2 and S3, which is here and here, right? And if we loop through them for every I, there's 256 I's, it's 512 clock cycles. Right? About. Plus or minus, say, five clock cycles. But if we coded this in a microprocessor with C code, and let's assume some very uh, beneficial assumptions, like, for every single iteration of I, we need to move memory to the local registers. We need to subtract. We need to compute the absolute value. We need to add. We need to increment I. And let's just say that each loop just is six cycles. And that's, again, very generous. Because if you have a miss in memory, memory is, if you need, if you're just going to DDR around 100 times slower than the processor. So if I miss in memory, like my local cache, and I have to go to DDR, I have to wait 100 clock cycles just to get the data out of it. So again, we're making very beneficial assumptions for the microprocessor here. So we have 256 times 6, 1536 cycles. And the other assumption that we're making is the cycle time is the same. The cycle time is not going to be the same for these two things. We divide the number of clock cycles. The circuit is three times faster than the CPU code, the microprocessor. And you can only imagine if I have some cache misses. Every single miss, add 100 clock cycles, right? There's two different arrays I'm accessing. And there's no way that I'm going to increment I, move data, subtract, compute this absolute value, and add to sum in six cycles. So this is our benefits, right? Faster more energy efficient, possibly more cost effective. This is why we bother with basic design with digital logic circuits. You understand? OK, the other thing that we should understand is this circuit that we have created with this design is not the best circuit that we can make. We can leverage parallelism in hardware too. We have, here we're iterating through it one at a time, right? But I have all 256 values, right? They're just sitting in an array. I can do four at a time. Eight at a time, 256 at a time. It's just going to cost me a little bit more adders, which are just subtractors, right? And then I have to create this tree like structure to combine my results. Because I can I add these two together, add these two together, add these two, these two, and then I add those two together, right? 
So we can make this even faster. We could do this calculation in one clock cycle if we wanted to. Maybe our cycle time is a little longer, but we could do it in one clock cycle. And we'll talk more about this unfolding and pipelining and how to optimize these circuits later this week or next week. So we'll see exactly how to do this. But you've already seen pipelines. In your memory lab, you have to do pipelining. The pipelining is hiding the delay of getting the data from memory. So it's doing two things kind of at the same time. I'm computing my average, and I'm requesting the next data point at the same time. That's pipelining. All right. So. For our high-level state machines, we sometimes have data or control-dominated dom RTL designs. So data-dominant designs is what you would expect. It's a very complex data path, but a very simple controller. And then there's also control-dominant designs with a complex controller, but simple data path. So what do we think our memory lab is? Data dominant or control dominant? Data dominant. Yeah, it's data dominant. The control is relatively simple, right? It's just four states. But the data path, I have those registers. I have that. I have to calculate the average. I need to increment my read address, write address. It's more data dominant. So here is another example that we're going to cover. It's a filter. And what is this filter? If you read this description, we've seen it already before. This is just a little bit different FIR filter. Okay. So it takes samples, averages the last n values. And the whole goal is to remove some noise. So this is, like we just talked about, a data dominant RTL design example. So this is our FIR filter. And this filter is not only taking the average, but it's configurable in that it's taking this weighted sum of the previous inputs. So C0, C1, C2, it's like a weight. And this one is three tap because we're looking at the previous three values. And it just is mentioning that three tap is not very common. Like usually it's a lot larger than that. And this one is going to be a general filter because we can set our parameters for what our weights are. And based on the weights, we can design a more specific filter. So here's our three tap. This is the function. So here is our RTL design. First step, create the high level state machine, right? So to initialize, that's our first state. And we just Reset everything, set our weights to what they should be. So it's three, two, two. And then after we initialize, we're doing our filter compute. Multiply the value by its weights, sum them all up, and set it as the output. 
And the reason that this one is simpler is because we're not fetching the data from memory, right? We're just assuming that we get x1, x2, x0 just as input into this finite state machine. So here it is. This is our data path. So we have this chain of x of t registers to hold the value of x. That is just incoming. We don't need to specify any memory address or anything like that. And we're going to instantiate registers for our parameters of the weights too. So we have x for our inputs, c's for our weighted values. And then we need the adders and multipliers to calculate this equation, right? So these three multipliers are doing C0 times X0, C1, X1, C2, X2. And then we sum X0 with X1, and then that sum with X2 to give us our overall sum. So we only need these two adders. Now we have Y as our outputs. Right. So the next step is create the controller, right? So here's our finite state machine. And we just need to set clear and load lines appropriately in order to do this, right? So we have clear for these registers. These get loaded in the first state. And then the C's are not loaded here. And we're just loading for Y reg. And also loading for X0, X1, X2. Right? So complex data path. Simple controller, data dependence, or data dominated RTL design. Right? So now, if we do this comparison again between this very, uh, I don't want to say simple, but unoptimized circuit, right? We have the adder, it's a two gate delay, and we're saying a multiplier has 20 gate delay. The longest path grow, goes through one multiplier and two adders, right? So it's depicted here. From this register to this register is my longest path. So we have 24 gate delay. And then if we have, say, a 100 tap filter, it would have a 34 gate delay rather than 24. We have 24 because we only have three inputs. And if we have the software implementation, we need to do for a 100 tap filter, 100 multiplications, 100 additions. Let's just say it's two instructions per multiplication, two per addition, and 10 gate delay per instruction, which again is not realistic, right? We have 4,000 gate delays versus 34. So even this simple unoptimized circuit is going to be a lot faster than a microprocessor trying to do the same thing. Right? So that's, yeah. So what's the trade-off? When is it better for a microprocessor to do something with circuit than the circuit? The circuit does one thing. Microprocessor, what can I do with it? More, what's the word? Oh, oh like multi-threading? Mm. Oh. I can reprogram it. Oh, okay. Right? 
So if my application changes, I can just reprogram the process. But if I've built a million of these and I've deployed a million of these, and then suddenly my users need a four tap filter. I have to now build a million more of these <laughs> with the four tap filter. But that's also where you can have this in between, right? The FPGA is in between. You reprogram the FPGA, right? It's still a digital logic circuit. It's still not general purpose like a processor, but you can reprogram it. It's not going to be as efficient or as fast as an ASIC design, but one other way that you can use the FPGA is I use it as my prototyping. I make sure my design is the best it can be, and then and I verify it with the FPGAs, and then I take that design. You use the same design files of VHD, or if you're using system Verilog, it's SV files, and you take that to someone like Global Foundries or TSMC, and they can build it. Any other questions? Yeah. These? Oh, it's because we didn't. Uh, we're just saying that we need to set these to make this happen. So we didn't. This is still just the high level state machine. So like if I want y reg to be 0, xt to be 0, x1, xt1, xt2, all of these to be 0, that means that y reg clear is 1, right? And then xt0 clear is 1 xt1 clear is 1, xt2 clear is 1, right? And then for c0, c1, c2 to be set to their proper values, that just means that c0 load, c1 load, c2 load need to be 1 in this state. And then in this state, I need to make sure that y red clear is 0. Because if it's zero, my y is always just going to be zero. And that y reg load is one, so that it can become this computed value. And then my x, t's, their loads need to be one in order to shift to the next one and shift in the new value. And x, t, zero clear needs to be zero. And then C0 load so that they don't change because I only intend them to change here. They should also be zero. Other question? Okay, so this Wednesday is your next quiz, right? We're going to do the quiz for the first 25 minutes. And I think rather than doing more lecture after, because I already prepared you for the lab, we can just go over the quiz together after. So we'll do it that way. But do prepare for the quiz. You have that homework on finite state machines. We have the lecture slides on finite state machines. There's a couple examples on the slides that we didn't cover that you can do as practice as well. Right? So I think if you can do the homework, you should be able to do the quiz. Because the homework is going to encompass everything. You need to know how to go from the description to the Finite state machine, and then from the finite state machine, what's my process to create the circuits? The quiz will not do every single step because you only have 25 minutes. But if you know how to do every single step, you can do the subset that the quiz is asking for. I 
I mean, if it'll say if it's melee or not. But you know the difference between melee and melee. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, code today. Um, I need to activate it first. It's for the wrong class right now. 301. This is 24. Okay. Your code is 798. So just answer anything. And then that is all for today.